when the emphasis is not the altar of God, it ends up being on something else. It might end up being on my faithfulness. It might end up being on my consistent service to the community or the church or the Lord. My confidence can shift to where I go, who I go with, what I do there. There's so many impotent altars with so many gathered around in adoration. And this new cross, this new altar becomes a snare and it actually keeps people out of the kingdom of God. It's not a game. So he starts by repairing the altar before the eyes of all the people. Then in verse 31, Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob. That's 1 Kings 18, 31. That was Elijah took 12 stones. This is ironic because all of Israel is watching. This this square off between light and darkness, between true worship and false worship, between a real altar and false demonic altars. And all Israel is there for this event. Elijah takes those stones and he takes them in deliberate awareness of the commandment of God. It says in Exodus 20, if you'll turn there just for a moment and keep your finger in 1 Kings. Exodus chapter 20, verse 25. Exodus is the Second book of your Bible, Exodus chapter 20, starting with 25 and then going to 26. Exodus 20, verse 25, here's what it says, God speaking through Moses. If thou will make me an altar of stone, and what was Elijah doing here? He was making an altar that was largely constructed of stone and wood. Thou shalt not build it of hewn stone. That means you will not build it of cut stones. For if thou shalt lift up thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. He's saying there that you get stones as they are in the rough, crude as they might look. You don't touch it, you don't corrupt it, you don't pollute it with human hands. You don't quarry the stones, you don't polish the stones, you don't fancify the stones so you can present them to the people and say, isn't this altar of Jesus Christ a wonderful thing to behold? Come, carnal person, you'll be right at home here. It will simply add to your life. It will simply upgrade your life, as I heard one individual preach some years ago. No, the Holy Spirit said, The stones that will make up my altar will not be cut with your tools, will not be fashioned according to what you like or your likeness. He said, if you do that, he goes on in verse 26, excuse me, neither shall thou go up by steps upon mine altar. The true altar of God is not a place for self-exaltation. It's not a place where you prop yourself up and look like something. It's a place of brokenness. It's a place of contrition. It's a place of repentance. It's a place of heart searching. It's a place of true faith before the Almighty, offering nothing to Him of your own doing. Nothing in your hands I bring, in my hands I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling, the songwriter said. He said, if you go up the altar, all you're going to do is expose your own nakedness. That's essentially what verse 26 is all about. So Elijah didn't seek stones that had been beautified by man. For in actuality, the only beauty in the universe that is pure, in the strictest definition of purity, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And is his willing sacrifice when he died for a reprobate, a stubborn fool like me, and dare I say like even you, That's the beauty. And God the Holy Spirit does not need man's cleverness to present it. And sadly, many in the church today, 
in America and other countries of the world as well, but especially here, we are trying to produce and fashion a palatable form of the gospel to supposedly win the lost. But the Holy Spirit, and thank God Elijah heard it, don't touch it with your tools, just gather the stones, present it as it is, and then you can expect the fire of God. Don't contaminate it with flesh. Don't contaminate it with human ideas. Don't try and refashion God. Don't remove the offense of the cross. Don't bypass his holiness. Don't bypass judgment. For if you do, you can offer the people nothing, no real forgiveness, no real cleansing, no real clean conscience, nothing but a service dressing. Jeremiah prophesied it elsewhere in the sixth chapter, I believe. These people, these false prophets, they heal the wound of my people superficially or slightly. And they prophesy falsely, and my people love it so. What an indictment upon an entire generation of descendants of Abraham. And dare I say, what an indictment upon multitudes that profess Jesus Christ today with our fancy quarried polished, decorative stones that we call the gospel. The cross of Christ has no outward beauty. Isaiah 53 said there was no form in him that would attract man. There was no form, no comeliness in him. There was nothing about him that would excite the natural senses. He was just a man. But he was also more than a man. And the natural eyes can't see that. It takes the Spirit of God to turn the lights on with a humble, sin-sick, tired soul. Dare we ever try and make the altar appealing or attractive to fallen humanity. The only attraction is to the humble member of fallen humanity. When he looks up and he sees mercy, in the eyes of one who deserved no judgment and yet took it all, that he might gather them as a, as a hen gathers her chicks and be the provision for all eternity that we need. So Elijah shows in the gathering of those stones the importance of following the pattern established by God in the Scripture and how important it is not to veer from that pattern. Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5, I'll read it. Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle, Hebrews 8, 5. For God said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. That was Mount Sinai where he received the law. Don't veer from the pattern. We should never expect God's mighty intervention, his fire, until we first come to terms with his requirements and his ways. Lighthouse Gospel Church is nothing without the fire of God. Nothing. Our singing is vain without the fire of God. Our preaching is powerless without the true fire from heaven. Our witness to the community is irrelevant. It's, it's, a, it's a moot point. It's, it's nothing but another program without the fire of God. Our lives are barren without the fire of God. Our, our professed love for sound doctrine, and we ought to love sound doctrine, we ought to not bow before the winds and waves of, of new doctrines or repackaged old doctrines. We ought to love the bedrock of truth, but if we don't have the fire of God burning in our souls, even a love for sound doctrine can become wood, wooden and cold and, and calculated and mental but not heartfelt. Without the fire of God, we might as well close down tomorrow. We need the fire of God. We have no right to exist as a church apart from the God who answers by fire, reigning and living within our individual hearts. And 1 Kings 18.32 says, And he built an altar in the name of the Lord. That's a, quite a statement, brief as it is. He built an altar in the name of the Lord. What does that mean? He, he built it for the Lord's glory. 
He built it according to the Lord's way. 